welcome Apostle Buddy to the pulpit. Well, praise the Lord in the house. Oh, thank you, Lord. It's so good to be here with you today. Thank you for the encouragement. Father, we are thankful today that the risen Christ is representing us today in the heavenly, seated at your right hand, Father, ever making intercession for us. And we thank you for every word that comes forth out of your mouth, Father, that comes through our mouth, that it shall not return void, but accomplish wherein you've sent it. We thank you today for your presence, Holy Spirit. Instruct us, guide us, lead us into the truth that we would be set free, and those that have been set free shall stay and remain free indeed. So I thank you for everyone today, and we just bless the Lord our God, with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our being. And unto him be all the glory. And all the saints said, Amen. That was kind of weak. Can I hear it again? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now you may be seated. Thank you. Oh, it's so wonderful to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Thank you for your being willing to come and share your anointing with the others that are here. You know, it's the combined anointing that makes the difference. If we come together and we bring our shared anointing, then God is able to do that to a greater height. I've asked Brother Don Ely just to give us a quick update on what's going on with, uh, with him. And we're going to, he's going to be presenting the uh, What Can I Pray About for You Today a button. Uh, elders, come on up, Brother Don. Just tell us quickly what's going on. This... This passionate man for the Lord is desires to, above all else to see Lord glorified and lifted up Jesus Christ. And I'm with a fellowship that does the same. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. He wanted me to share a little bit about what's been going on out there on the road. We've got over 10,000 miles we've been on the road so far taking the work of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's been all good. Yeah. All good. All good. <laughs> I want to tell you about one little situation we had. We're over Mississippi, all the way west of Mississippi. Little Rock, Arkansas area. And uh, I had my wife call me. And uh, she said, where you at? And I said, Little Rock. Where you going? And I said, probably Dallas. And she said, there's 23 tornadoes on the ground in Texas right now. And, and then Oklahoma has their share. I would suggest you turn around. I felt, felt like God to me. <laughs> so I turned around and started back and uh, pulled off the highway right close to that, that area where she called me and uh, got some gas. And when I pulled out of the gas station, <clears throat> there was a, a patrol car there uh, giving someone a ticket. And uh, I tried to get over when I went by him, but I had a car on the inside lane where if I call, pull right over that trailer, 34 foot of trailer hangs out a long way behind me. And so I didn't go over all the way. And they came up and stopped me. They said, you know, you were supposed to come and pull over. I said, I thought I did as much as I could. And I think you could have got over. I said, okay. I usually get over good. And he didn't. He just asked me for my license. And, and as they're going back to their car, the Lord said, ask them if you can pray for them. I love that. So I said, excuse me, uh, the Lord just said that I need to pray for you. And they came over and said, oh, yeah, yeah. So they came by. There was a black man and a white man. And the black guy was kind of the guy in control, you could tell. He was a senior. So he walked up to me, and I just threw my arm around him. Now, we're out in the middle of traffic here. And I'm hugging on the cop. And the other fellow, the other fellow came over. I got a hold of his hand. And God gave me a prayer. Talk about a prophetic prayer. Yes. And I prayed the protection of them from evil people. Yes. And angry people. Yes. And uh, I prayed, and I, it didn't take a long time, but when I got through, I got through, and he, when I got through, he said, Phew, the black guy said, man, thank you for that. Yes. And as they're going back to their car, they, he turned around and said, can you get a picture of me in front of this trailer? So I took a picture of the two of them in front of the trailer, just smiling. And uh, after I got through with that, 
They wanted two or three. They wanted to make sure they came out. He, I had to send one to his phone and go off through all that. Oh, he sent it to me on my phone. I didn't know how to do that, okay? So then he wants to get a picture of me in front of the trailer. So they're going back to their car, and I'm just knowing that God just had something to do with it. I mean, really. That night, I don't normally, I normally eat in the trailer, but I went into a restaurant. And two black, a black man and a white man had been killed that day in Mississippi. It sounded like my guys. But I said, ain't no way. Not the way God just prayed. And no way is my guys. And I saw a picture the next day on television. It wasn't, it was two in the same area of Mississippi. You know, God had a plan to protect those guys. I mean, really. I mean, he had a plan. And I was a part of it. Hallelujah. He loves people to pray. He loves people that like to pray. He'll give you an opportunity. We've got buttons out here for sale today uh, out in the foyer. Uh, I cannot tell you how many people my wife and I pray for in a day, in a week's time. It is amazing how many people. And they'll come up to you. I mean, you have, I mean now I ask people. Pastor Buddy's been with me. You know, I ask people. You know, can I pray for you? Because they'll look at my button, and I'll say, uh, I know, I know, they know, I said, can I pray for you? And almost, all, I mean, seriously, is that right? It, I, I get a chance to pray for everybody, well, most everybody. And I tell you, God gives me a word for them. I'm not trying to prophesy over them, but that's what I end up doing. I end up actually prophesying over them. It's over and over and over. And I love being used. Uh, just keep on supporting us. We appreciate your support. I really do. Uh, a lot of miles, a lot of gas. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Woo. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. He just adds something to that because I got one of their buttons and I did. He was going to give it to me, but I did. They, it, they do cost. Yeah. So I did give him that. So if you get a button, but. In one week, when I wore the button, I prayed at least over five people. And one of them was in a department store, and I forgot I had the button on. And I was in a hurry. And I was trying to get up to pay for my thing, and she very quietly said, would you pray for me? And I said, what'd you say? <laughs> she said, would you pray for me? And I said, oh, yeah, oh, yes. So she said, my son-in-law just died in California. I just got the message, and we need prayer desperately. I'm telling you, the button does work. All you need to do is put it on, and you will find people will be walking up to you. They will be doing it in department stores. They'll be doing it on the street. This button has an anointing on it. <laughs> and it's very, it's not intimidating at all. You just wear it. And what does it say? What do, I don't have my, how can I pray, how can I pray for you? And I'm telling you, people, I, I just meet them all over the place that are ready to have someone pray for them. So get a button. Get a button. Amen. Get a button. <laughs> people are desperate for the Lord. They are desperate to have a relationship with the Lord. And most people fear that they don't have the relationship they desire to have so we can be an instrument. But the Life Center is constantly touching lives. Yes. And we're touching lives that touch lives that touch lives. One of the purpose, one of our purposes is to reproduce reproducers. And so like even yesterday, there was almost, I don't know, a couple of hundred people here getting uh, the advanced training in the vo hearing the voice of the Lord and prophetic. Now those people represent many other people and they are teaching and instructing others. So your, your commitment is the Lord is using and he's using our commitment and he's using us to affect the lives of thousands of thousands of people. And sometimes we forget that when we uh, look at our own situation and wonder what are we doing, but so much of our ministry is outside of this local gathering, but it doesn't mean we're not doing what God said to do. Can I hear an amen this morning? 
So that is going to be what I want to share with you today is that we are touching lives and I don't believe we've begun to reach the numbers and the extension uh, that God intends for us to reach. I'd like to get an agreement on that. Could I get an agreement? That we are just in the beginning. This morning I want to speak to you on the subject of filling the chest of Joash. Filling the chest of Joash. And uh, you'd say, well, who is Joash? Well, let me tell you a little bit about him. You know, it's interesting when you go back and read the kings and the succession of kings. And after Solomon, uh, he was promised that from him would become a united kingdom that would go on for generations. But because of Solomon and his infidelities and his drifting away from the Lord, the Lord was not able to deliver the promise in that direction and the kingdom became divided. And then you had Judah and Israel and each one of them had their own kings and they would often even fight each other as time went on. But one thing in history tells us, there are always good kings and bad kings. And there always will be good kings and bad kings and good people and bad people. But I want to remind you today, and uh, that the good people win out. Did you hear me? The good people will always win out because they have God on their side and God will win no matter what. He will win the, the victory in the end and he's allowed us to participate with him in obtaining that victory. But one of the things that the people continued to do was always go back to worship idols, worship Baal. And I'm not sure why that was, but I'm sure we have the same struggle today with the, with the world. We worship the money, we worship the people, we worship influence and things like that. But God sent a, a king and a prophet named Jehu, and he was tough. Jehu was all bordered on being mean, but he was God's man that needed to, that needed to be used to bring righteousness back into the land and so he did and and uh, part of that was as he was destroying Baal and he got them all together by the way it was interesting as you go back and read it and he got them all in in one building all of Baal's prophets and he said if there's anybody in here that worships the other God the uh, that what we would call the God of Israel then you need to get out of here because this is for Baal worshipers and though all that meant that all that were left were those that were Baal uh, prophets and priests, and he killed them all, every one of them, I mean, down to the last person. So he, he did not let any unrighteousness take root. And so one of, one of the things that came out of that was when he went through all of that killing, the uh, mother of Hazariah was, uh, Hazariah was the king of Judah, and he was ruling and and uh, his mother saw the, when he died, she saw the opportunity. And uh, Adaliah was, is her name. And Adaliah saw the opportunity to take over the kingship. So she just had all of the heirs killed. And that's amazing because I suppose that that was his mother, but maybe not uh, his father or vice versa. I don't know. I couldn't figure that one out. But anyway, they hid away jo Joash. He was, he was just born, and he was a baby, and they hid him away as the only legitimate heir of the king that could rule and reign. So after, actually, it was uh, Adaliah's sister that hid him away. And so realizing that, so he became, at seven years old, the ruler of it, Judah. He was the eighth ruling king in Judah, and he did that, and he reigned, by the way, for 40 years. So he was 47 when he was killed, again, by some of his own people. But they were, those were the kind of days that they lived in. And, and Jodah, uh, Jehoiada was the chief priest. And he was the one that set up with, with uh, Joash to be his mentor, his intercessor, and he made an agreement or a covenant with the Lord and the king and the people that he would bring up the king in the way he should go. And it's interesting because the scripture is, when we read it, is he did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days 
in which Jehoda, the priest, instructed him almost. It's always that almost, isn't it? He was faithful in every way for most of his life until the chief priest died and the influence left. And then, as always happens, uh, all the elders of Judah came in and said, you know, we think this is the way it should be done. This is the way that we think is fair. Oh, this is right. This is what's right. And listen, folks, God makes the rule book because He knows how the end is. He understands the beginning and the end, and He understands what must take place. So He began to listen to them, and after uh, what many years, until they were in conflict and chaos and overrun, and it was because He fell out at the last of that time. So with, that's the setting for it. But when he was, Joash was king, he, he decided at some point that the temple was not being kept up. The way the word was, the way the money traveled was it was all brought to the priest and they in turn were responsible to keep up the temple. But they had also the opportunity to represent the people. Well, it, I don't know whether there was not enough money or there was not the best use of money, but the temple was in disrepair, and so they needed to do something. And Jehoda, he died at, uh, right, at not long after this, at 130 years old, by the way. So they were ready to keep up the temple. It had been 23 years since he had been made king. And we're going to pick up the scripture there at 2 Kings 12, starting with the fourth verse. And I want you to know that's what had happened. The king, Joash, says it's time to repair the temple, and here's how we're going to do it. And so Joash said to the priest, All the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring unto the house of the Lord. Let the priests take it to themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation is found. Now it's easy. It, so King Jos, Je, Joash, <laughs> uh, now it was so by the 23rd year of King Joash, that the priest had not repaired the damages of the temple. So King Joash called Je Jehoda, the king priest, and the other priests, and said to them, Why have you not repaired the damages of the temple? Now therefore do not take more money from your constituencies, but deliver it from repairing the, for repairing the damages of the temple. And the priest agreed that they would neither receive more money from the people nor repair the damages of the temple. Then Jodahiah, the priest, took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who kept the door put there all the money brought into the house of the Lord. So it was, whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and put it in bags and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they gave the money which had been apportioned unto the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it out of the carpenters and builders who worked on the house of the Lord. And to masons and stone cutters and for building, buying timber and hew stone to repair the damages of the house of the Lord and for all that it was paid out to repair the temple. And however there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, trimmers, sprinkling, bowls, trumpets, any articles of gold or articles of silver from the money brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and they repaired the house of the Lord with it. So that was how Joash took a, a, a chest and bored a hole in it 
and put it by the altar right outside of the, of the worship place. And there the people voluntarily put their money into it. And there was so much money came in that they had to do, uh, empty it every day. And there was more than enough money that they would repair the temple and bring it back to its place. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is time and timing. There's time and then there's timing. We know that there are two ways that we talk about it, chronos and kairos. And the chronos and kairos are two different things. Chronos has to do with the chronological way that we measure time. Now, we know that God doesn't live in time. He lives outside of time, and he brought time into being in order that we would have a way to relate to him. He brought all things into a form that would allow us to measure all of these things, and so it was that he brought about the calendar. It talks about in Titus 1 and 3 there that it was talking about Paul, and he, but he says, In due time manifested his word through preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. But he said exactly the right time he brought to Paul the revelation that he needed to be able to define and describe the church and the mystery revealed from the beginning of time. And so we begin to see that there is timing, chronological timing, but there is also the timing of the Lord. Like I say, there's not Eastern Standard Time that the Lord works on, but eternal standard time is the work of the Lord. And if you look at your own life, as I have often in mine, I look back and I see how God had been preparing me for certain things in my life that at the time I couldn't understand it, but there was a time coming in that Kairos time when it was the time for opportunity to be presented. And when we're not ready for opportunity, we may miss the opportunity. It's the same word that's used when an arrow is being shot. It's at exactly the right time that you release the arrow to be sure you hit the target. That's Cairo's time. To be sure when opportunity comes to us as a body of believers, as a body of Christ, or in, or in your own life individually, if you're not sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and learn to hear the voice of the Lord, you may miss your Cairo's time. Now, how many in here want to be on time with the Lord, on your Kairos time? You want to be, have your ears sensitive to the voice of the Lord, your heart tender to His presence, and your absolutely your mind sensitive to He's first in my life, and if I look to Him for all things first, then all of these other things shall be added unto me. But how many of you know sometimes the other things get in the way of hearing those opportune times? We have a heart that's ready for God. We love God, but we're not sensitive to his timing, and we look back and opportunity, Kairos, means it, it's a picture of a man that's running fast, so fast that his hair is blowing by, behind him as he runs, and we have to reach out and catch him. Get that moment that comes, and I, you know, God sometimes, uh, he goes on, he gives us an opportunity, and if we miss it, that doesn't mean he's mad at us, it just means, sorry, I'll find somebody else down the road who's ready to, be, to serve me. And we get so, you know, we, when I look at the end of every day, I always come to back to that same conclusion, Lord, I just want what you can do, not what I can do. What you do, you do it so much better. What you do, you do it in the fullness. What you do lasts. What I seem to do doesn't seem to last that long. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. Now you know, you come on, hear, my, hear, hear what the Lord is saying this morning. So that is what was happening there. It was a time when the opportunity was there and it was time for revival to come about. In Mark 13, 33, that's where they were questioning Jesus. What time are you coming back? And he said, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Watch and pray. Watch. Be conscious. I'm talking about spiritually. Be conscious. Most of us know when we're in the groove. Most of us know when we're in the spiritual zone. And sometimes, even when we're in the zone, we don't listen very well. 
We have a stubbornness about ourselves, you know, and, you, and a questioning, God, I wonder if this is you, and if this is you, why would you want to do it that way? I think I'll just wait and see. And there goes Cairo. It just went by. <laughs> so you begin to see that there is a key time that God is calling us, and it, so it was with Joash. After 23 years, suddenly he just didn't wake up one morning and say, what are you doing with all that money? He started looking around and saying, wait a minute, there's a greater glory ahead of us. Because you see, following this, there was revival. The revival came, the, the work was done, the temple was restored and revival came. But what happened was they fell back into their old ways and didn't keep building on the new that was there. So we began to see that, that there is opportunity, but we have to... Wait for it. I, I hear people all the time tell me, well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to tell me what he wants to do. And I've been thinking about that. If God told you that he wanted you to be a surgeon, you wouldn't sit around and wait till he equipped you. If he did, I'm not coming to see you. I'll just get you to lay hands on me. But once the Lord gives you a moment, a word, an opportunity, go to work on it at some level right then. Don't wait until I just hope and God opens the door and it all falls out. You've got to start with where you are with what you had. He said, Moses, what's in your hand? Use what's in your hand right now, wherever you are. If he gives you a word of the Lord, start preparing yourself to be fulfilled. That's what it takes, the fulfillment of the word. It takes taking, we, we know that the Lord gives his word in seed form, and we have to plant that seed. So when you plant that seed, you start right then, and you say, okay, if the Lord's called me to travel the earth, and he's called me to, to do this, I better start learning how to speak. Maybe I have to go talk to my mirror. Maybe I'll talk to my family until they're tired of hearing me. It's kind of like when I was growing up, my sister took piano lessons. I, th I thought I'd gonna go crazy listening to those, running those same scales over and over and over again. She never played for an audience, thank goodness, <laughs> until she did. And then she did one day, and then that was the, she began to see, wait a minute, had I not practiced, I would not have been ready. If God's called you to go around the earth, better get your passport, better get your faith extended, better get started on the things that prepare you for the things that God's called you to do. Don't just wait till God opens in a miracle door. Get started. Somebody hearing me this morning, I know there's somebody hearing me today. And so it was, there was a time when Joash was saying, now is the time, now is the time. There's glory coming, but we got to get the temple ready. This is not a good looking temple for people to come to. It's got cracks in the walls. The pillars are beginning to lean a little bit. And it needs a little whitewash on the outside. Come on. It needs some things, but it, 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 it just demonstrates to us that we're ready for opportunity. That when the Kairos comes, we're ready for it. And that's what he knew. And it says that there is a time coming. And we know that it was. In Matthew 9, 20, 22, it says there, it talks about, and suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But she knew she had a word. I know that if I touch his garment, I've heard the Lord say if I touch his garment, I know that what I've got to do, but he's over there and between him and me is a whole lot of resistance. But I'm going to press on through. Come on, church. I'm going to press on through. I'm going to work my way through. I'm going to do what the Lord said to do. I'm going to touch his garment because it's my Kairos time. It's my moment in time. The Lord has promised, and I know my part is to get to him. Now, he may promise me everything, but I've got to get to him and touch his garment because the anointing of healing was there. So it's a miracle opportunity coming towards you, and we don't want it to pass us by. So there's time and timing. 23 years was not the key. It was the timing of the Lord setting them up for revival. And then there's the second thing I noticed in looking through this scripture is a heart to give. We read that in a few moments ago. You see, you have to have a heart to give. If you don't give out of a heart for it, just like every opportunity comes with a heart, 
Sometimes I know that uh, things become uh, routine as they should. Let's call it habits. What successful do people do is they develop successful habits. Did you hear me? <laughs> successful people develop successful habits. That's why you say. That's why people of the world will say you got to read the word. You know, and they'll say, well, you got to read the word an hour a day. It's got to get in a habit. And then people of prayer say you got to pray at least an hour a day. Pentecostal, you got to get in your closet and pray an hour a day in tongues. Well, after a while, there's no day left. <laughs> I pray, I, I prophesy, I listen. You get my point. The habit of being in constant awareness of the Lord and spending time with Him all the time so that you're with him all the time. Yes, you pray to him. Yes, you are talking to him. Yes, you're reading his word as he lays upon you that anointing and building a good habit. So we, giving is a habit. Fortunately, I got that lesson early on in, our, in our, my life and in our married life. We got that lesson that tithing and giving was the way, it's a principle of God, and if I obey the principle of God, he will do what he says he will do. That is his promise. And so fortunately, and I say fortunately because it came a habit and we never think about it. We never discuss about the tithing or giving. That comes as a part of listening to the Holy Spirit. And when he, when he gives us an urge, we respond. But uh, they made very, they set priorities. And the priority was that they had to repair the temple. The temple was 153 years old at this time, and so it needed some repairs, and it was time. And, and so they said, we got to have a special offering, and, and we know that if we're talking about an offering that was above the tithe, because it says later on that they were to bring to the priest, were to receive the offerings for, that, that they were to give the priest for interceding for them for praying for them, for what they call the guilt offering. And so they, they would bring that, and they were to keep that. But all the special offering was to go to repair the temple, this 153-year-old Ephesus of the beauty and the holiness of God. So there they were at this temple. Now, Life Center, this morning, we have, I want to give you the opportunity to know, we have three things that we have a need for. Our temple has some things that need repairing. We have some special needs. And not any of these things are a special effect. I wish we had, we had, a, you know, we, people used to say to me, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that at the Life Center. And I'd say, I don't know how long your list is, but mine's longer. <laughs> the things we need to do are, my, my want to, have to, need to is longer than yours. Because you can only do that, but the priority is, if we're going to get ready for the glory, if we're going to get ready for the revival, if we're going to get ready for the expansion, if we've touched 100,000 lives, we need to touch a half a million lives. And if our time is coming, we need to be ready for it. We have thousands of people that come through here every year, but more importantly, there are thousands of people that are out there being touched that were trained here. And so I believe that we're into a process of where that's about to grow greater. Can I get an agreement on that? And that's important because you're a part of it. And we're all a part, we're a body of believers. And the three things that must happen, and we'll talk about it, is, you know what, we got a roof that just won't be repaired anymore. We repaired it and repaired it, and now we got to have a new roof. Say new roof. New roof. You didn't answer. Say new roof. New roof. Thank you. We got to have a new roof, not an old patched roof, but a new roof. Isn't that great? I mean, that means for the next generation, hopefully they won't have to have another new roof. That new roof will satisfy us for this rest of this time. We've got to have also some more air conditioning. Amen. Amen. I heard that. I heard amen. <laughs> we, we're kind of spoiled. We like air conditioning, you know. I brought back some seeing the fan. With the fan this morning, both of them going. <laughs> I went to my sister's funeral this week. Thank you all so much for your cards and emails and texts and all that. Thank you so much. And I did the eulogy at the funeral and was honored to do so. And it was hot, like South Georgia can be. And it was humid. And so when we got to the gravesite, they all passed out their fans. And all of them had the funeral home on them. <laughs> 
and then on the other side, the same picture since 19, I mean 1888 when they were founded, they still got that same picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You've seen it on the rock right there where he's praying. And I'm thinking, maybe we ought to just take a load of these back to the Life Center. <laughs> And we wouldn't need an air conditioning. We can all fan at the funeral fans. We could keep them going. And <laughs> Dr. Mary says no more funeral fans, you know. But we don't we want air conditioning, right? And so we're gonna need some air conditioning a lot more. We've had this same air conditioning system now since 1996. And so now it's time. And the third thing that we need to get ourselves in order is we need our parking lot recovered. I mean, it's one thing for that we like. We, if we don't, we're going to have to mow the grass in the parking lot. <laughs> it's growing so tall that we may have to and, <laughs> and things like that. But if we do it now, we can do it for a whole lot less than we can in a, if it gets worse. So those are the three needs that we have. Now, why do we need them? Because the Kairos time is coming. Yeah. We have to get that in our hearts of heart. It's, it's not just to repair for for the future and stop the leak it's for preparing for what God's about to bring to us and he's about to do that I believe that yes. amen you believe it say amen. amen okay the third thing is heart a sacrifice for success it begins in the heart the people had to make a sacrifice they brought so much to the uh, Joash's uh, ark or his, his mantle place is that they had so much overflowing that they were able to buy the serving trays, the silver serving trays, and all of the things that they needed that were not part of the essentials of putting the temple back together. So if we have an, an abundance, we have more than enough places that we can put it. Now let me say this is, but while saying this, that this, we have, the, I want to commend our staff and, and Elder Blake and his team and for what they've done to help prepare us for these workers. We have worked and worked and worked and gotten multiple bids and mul talked to multiple contractors and we've and, and every one of them's got their own idea. And you all all know how that works. Everybody's got the way it should be. And we've had everything from all over the as you can imagine, all over the place in terms of prices and bids. But we've also looked beyond the price to the integrity of the person doing the work. That's right. The integrity is as important as the price because if you're left halfway and you've got to spend the money to clean up, you, you, you're going to spend double. So we feel that we have people who have a reputation and a track record of being able to do it. And we've got some excellent, excellent prices. So we're thankful for that. And while the prices are where they are, uh, if a building boom comes, I'll promise you the prices will go up. They always do. And that was the thing that caused us to build this building when we did. When they announced that the Olympics were coming to Atlanta, we knew that meant that prices were going to go up, and they went up almost 40%. So we immediately, at that point, started the building program and were able to beat those increases. Well, I feel the same way right now. It's our Kairos time to take advantage of some good price quotes that we have. But it has to begin in our heart. And uh, you know, there are many things that God does when he calls people to give. It, it teaches us, first of all, let me say God's serious about giving. God so loved the world, what? He, what? He gave, he gave, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives. And you know, he's unlimited in his resources, and so he wants to give more. If you are, a, you, you've been a parent or been a, had a parent, all of us, and if, you know, you love to do for your kids. What is it? If you see in them the character and the integrity to handle it, you just want to pour it on them, but you're always testing them to see how well they respond to what you do. And so it is with God. He gives us something, and when we're faithful in it, He gives us more. And when we're faithful in that, He gives us more. So it becomes a way of proving ourselves to the Lord that we trust Him. Because the bottom line is, do I trust God? Truly, that is the bottom line. When it gets down to it, do I really trust God to take care of my needs? So it begins in the heart, 
And God teaches us to put himself first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek him first. And he, doesn't, he tells us don't worry about things if you trust in the Lord. And that take, I'm telling you, that takes faith. That takes a lot of faith, and you have to build that faith. It's not automatic, and it doesn't come in day one. You've got to build that faith, and you start where you are, and you start building and building and building away. So it says that's why in, in even the law of divine reciprocity that Jesus himself gave us in Luke 6, 38. We're familiar with it. But I want to remind you of it. Given it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, and will be put into your bosom. How many of you claim that today? Come on. Amen. For where the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And what Jesus was encouraging them to do is to trust the Lord, God, that as you give, he will give back. And he will be faithful because he loves to be a giver and, and he has to have a way to give. Most people are like people are about their finance. You know, we're the richest civilization that's ever listed in, ever existed in history and yet four-fifths of the people go uh, end up broke. Why is that? What's going on? It's because they all believe that one day, someday, I'll get all my debts paid off, and I'm going to have all this money, and then I'm going to live well. It doesn't work that way. Sorry to disappoint you this morning. I really am, because it doesn't work that way. It works by being consistent in what you do. A little bit over a long period of time will result in a lot more, and in investing it, at that point. Well, a lot of people feel that way about God. God, you know my heart. You know I'm going to give. When my time comes, I'm going to really show you how much I love you. When I get, when all that money's poured out on me and I can, I'm just going to give and give and give. And they get to that place and they can't give because they don't have. You get my point, don't you? If you don't, I'll preach it all over again. So you, you need to get that point this morning. But it starts with the heart. And it is, a, it is, we have to trust God with all of our hearts and be not foolish about it, but trust Him whatever He says. But it's not, I put it this way and put it up, no longer a debt we owe, but a seed to sow. That was the way the Lord talked about when He brought us out of the Old Testament of, of giving and tithing, and He said, now I'm going to take the shackles off and the bridles off financially, and I'm going to open you up and if you keep planting the seed, I'll keep bringing the harvest. And the bigger the seed, the more the harvest. And that was, God took the limits off through Jesus Christ when he said, Give, and it shall be given. Now, it's not, like I say, it's not like one day, someday it will happen. In Luke 16, 11, it talks about there that, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Those are Jesus' words, not mine. And those are the words of wisdom. It's kind of like the difference between kairos and chronos is the difference between intellect and wisdom. You can be, have so much smart that you know about everything, but if you don't know what to do with those smarts, you're not very wise. I know I'd rather have wisdom than intellect. I'd really know what to do, when to do, and how to do it, and use what God's given me. I'd like to have both, but I'm telling you, if wisdom is what we seek from the Lord, it tells us, in Corinthians, seek not the wisdom of the world, but seek the wisdom of God, which is the supernatural wisdom. And it's not like the world system. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on your can. That is not the way you do it. You give, you get all you can, give all you can, and give some more when God tells you to. He identifies our trust. When, let me tell you, then the, the when God created everything, he put all of it in his natural resources. Everything was in the earth. Everything that we would ever need was already there. The silver, the gold, the diamond, the internet, the oil, all of that was there. But man had to capture it and bring it from its natural resource. That's why we call that the wealth. Whatever God created, he created it was wealth. When you accumulate wealth, you put it back into the resources that God created. And so when, and when it's brought out of what it talks about spirit of mammon in, in Luke 16, it talks about when you take those natural resources of God, whatever they are, and you begin to turn them into the treasury of the day, the money, the currency of the day, that the key to that is the, the spirit that's upon you will attach itself to that money. 
when it goes, the conversion is when it goes from, from wealth to money, that's what we call the spirit of riches. Now, there's a spirit that's attached to it. It's a spirit that's attached to the, to, to the money itself or can be. If you don't manage it, it will manage you. And so that spirit can be a spirit of poverty. Suddenly, I, you know, people with a spirit of poverty not only oftentimes lack, but they resent people who have because they feel that spirit of poverty. And that spirit of poverty comes upon you. Or the spirit of mammon is taking that which was the resources of God and converting it into money to use on myself. That's the spirit of mammon. That's the spirit of the lust of money, the pride of life. And, and those are the things that the enemy uses when the conversion takes place. Or you can have the spirit of generosity. And that's God's spirit. When the spirit of generosity, and the more you have, the more you're able to do, and the more you're able to give. And so there is that spirit, and we have to take that spirit of poverty, and that spirit of, of mammon, and that spirit of, of selfishness, and we have to bring it under the dominion of God and the blood of Jesus. Can I hear an amen? amen? Well, agree with me, Father, now in the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit that would try to attach itself to our finances. I break every spirit of mammon that would try to come and take us and deceive us, that would tell us that we deserve it when we know, Lord, we haven't done what we need to do to you first. I bind that spirit in Jesus' name. And I declare that spirit is broken in this house. It shall not exist. The spirit of mammon is broken. The lust for money, the lust for power is broken in Jesus' name. And I declare that the blood of Jesus is more than adequate. The blood of Jesus is more than enough. And we will trust you, Father, first and foremost and put our trust in you. And we thank you, Lord, today that the spirit of mammon must come under our authority because you've given us that authority. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, we break that spirit uh, poverty, that spirit of mammon, but also that spirit of poverty where we are, Father, afraid because of whatever reason. We're afraid to trust you in all areas of our life. We can trust you for our healing. We can trust you for our future, but we cannot trust you with our money. So, Father, forgive us where we've done that. Bind that spirit right now of poverty. Let it be broken over us right now. We break it in the name of Jesus. And we declare that it has no place in our lives when we break that spirit of poverty and we release it and I break every assignment over everybody here and in the car under the voice that is being spoken today that that spirit of poverty is broken. Now, Father, we release that spirit of generosity over all of us today that we would understand the heart of the Father and respond out of that place and have that spirit of generosity that you intended for us to have when you showed us how generous you are, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, can I hear an amen this morning? Amen. Come on, take it on this morning. Yes, receive it this morning. Receive the deliverance this morning. Be, be delivered today. Don't get pulled into the, th the things of the enemy. We all have to fight our battles, and that's one we can take the authority over. So it identifies our trust. It, it identifies the spirits that are upon the money that we have in transfer of spirits. So we know that this morning, as we said, we got some repair to do. Now, the good news is it's not going to take all, a lot of money, but it's going to take some money. It's going to take $100,000. Now, that, in God's kingdom, that's not a great deal of money. Uh, I couldn't write that check if I had to. Maybe you could. But I can write a little bit of it. I can give a little bit of it. I can participate in it today. So we're going to, this morning, we're going to receive... This morning, we'll receive money. But we receive pledges also this morning to cover it in the next three months as it is being prepared. And basically, I'm going to get uh, Pastor Samuel to come and give us some numbers on the overhead of what we're talking about and how that breaks down. But it breaks down, I can say, into $58,000 for the roof and um, for the air conditioning, we can get it all fixed for about $27,000. And then the rest of it is going to be the parking lot for 12000 So we're going to look good, sound good, and be good. And we're going to be all ready and fresh and ready for the revival. We're embracing the Kairos time. We're, we're ready to go. Now you're already kind of getting a little stiff. You know, you say, well, I, 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 want, I want to obey God, but, I, you know, I don't know. Well, come on, let's pray about it. Let's get the mind of the Lord right now and see what he says to you. 
and you do what he says. Let that faith rise this morning, and you know you do what you can do, or what the Lord tells you you can do, and you know, do it. Come on, just do it this morning. I, I've already, Dr. Mary and I have already decided, and we're, we're going to participate at a good level. So do the best we can. So you do the same. I've had a little bit of a time to think about it. But you, you just, I, sometimes what you hear first is what God says. 